3. The First Supper to be Grateful During a conference on religion and peace, a Protestant minister came up to me toward the end of one of our meals together and said, Are you a grateful person? I was surprised. I was eating slowly, and I thought to myself, Yes, I am a grateful person. The minister continued, If you are really grateful, how can you not believe in God? God has created everything we enjoy, including the food we eat. Since you do not believe in God, you are not grateful for anything. I thought to myself, I feel extremely grateful for everything. Every time I touch food, whenever I see a flower, when I breathe fresh air, I always feel grateful. Why would he say that I am not? I had this incident in mind many years later when I proposed to friends at Plum Village that we celebrate a Buddhist Thanksgiving Day every year. On that day, we practice real gratitude, thanking our mothers, fathers, ancestors, friends, and all beings for everything. If you meet that Protestant minister, I hope you will tell him that we are not ungrateful. We feel deeply grateful for everyone and everything. Every time we eat a meal, gratitude is our practice. We are grateful for being together as a community. We are grateful that we have food to eat, and we really enjoy the food and the presence of each other. We feel grateful throughout the meal and throughout the day, and we express this by being fully aware of the food and living every moment deeply. This is how I try to express my gratitude to all of life. Looking into our food mindful eating is an important practice. It nourishes awareness in us. Children are very capable of practicing with us. In Buddhist monasteries, we eat our meals in silence to make it easier to give our full attention to the food and to the other members of the community who are present. And we chew each morsel of food thoroughly, at least 30 times, to help us be truly in touch with it. Eating this way is very good for digestion. Before every meal, a monk or a nun recites the five contemplations, This food is the gift of the whole universe, the earth, the sky, and much hard work. May we live in a way that is worthy of this food. May we transform our unskillful states of mind, especially that of greed. May we eat only foods that nourish us and prevent illness. May we accept this food for the realization of the way of understanding and love. Then we can look at the food deeply, in a way that allows it to become real. Contemplating our food before eating in mindfulness can be a real source of happiness. Every time I hold a bowl of rice, I know how fortunate I am. I know that 40,000 children die every day because of the lack of food and that many people are lonely, without friends or family. I visualize them and feel deep compassion. You don't need to be in a monastery to practice this. You can practice at home at your dinner table. Eating mindfully is a wonderful way to nourish compassion, and it encourages us to do something to help those who are hungry and lonely. We needn't be afraid of eating without having the TV, radio, newspaper, or a complicated conversation to distract us. In fact, it is wonderful and joyful to be completely present with our food. Living in the presence of God in the Jewish tradition, the sacredness of mealtimes is very much emphasized. You cook, set the table, and eat in the presence of God. Piety is an important word in Judaism, because all of life is a reflection of God, the infinite source of holiness. The entire world, all the good things in life, belong to God, so when you enjoy something, you think of God and enjoy it in His presence. It is very close to the Buddhist appreciation of interbeing and interpenetration. When you wake up, you are aware that God created the world. When you see rays of sunlight streaming through your window, you recognize the presence of God. When you stand up and your feet touch the ground, you know the earth belongs to God. When you wash your face, you know that the water is God. Piety is the recognition that everything is linked to the presence of God in every moment. The Passover Seder, for example, is a ritual meal to celebrate the freedom of the Israelites from bondage in Egypt and their journey home. During the meal, certain vegetables and herbs, salt, and other condiments help us touch what happened in the past, what was our suffering and what was our hope. This is a practice of mindfulness. The bread we eat is the whole cosmos. 
Christianity is a kind of continuation of Judaism, as is Islam. All the branches belong to the same tree. In Christianity, when we celebrate the Eucharist, sharing the bread and the wine as the body of God, we do it in the same spirit of piety, of mindfulness, aware that we are alive, enjoying dwelling in the present moment. The message of Jesus during the Seder that has become known as the Last Supper was clear. His disciples had been following him. They had had the chance to look in his eyes and see him in person, but it seems they had not yet come into real contact with the marvelous reality of his being. So when Jesus broke the bread and poured the wine, he said, This is my body. This is my blood. Drink it, eat it, and you will have life eternal. It was a drastic way to awaken his disciples from forgetfulness. When we look around, we see many people in whom the Holy Spirit does not appear to dwell. They look dead, as though they were dragging around a corpse, their own body. The practice of the Eucharist is to help resurrect these people so they can touch the Kingdom of Life. In the Church, the Eucharist is received at every Mass. Representatives of the Church read from the Biblical passage about the Last Supper of Jesus with His Twelve Disciples, and a special kind of bread called the Host is shared. Everyone partakes as a way to receive the life of Christ into his or her own body. When a priest performs the Eucharistic rite, his role is to bring life to the community. The miracle happens not because he says the words correctly, but because we eat and drink in mindfulness. Holy Communion is a strong bell of mindfulness. We drink and eat all the time, but we usually ingest only our ideas, projects, worries and anxiety. We do not really eat our bread or drink our beverage. If we allow ourselves to touch our bread deeply, we become reborn, because our bread is life itself. Eating it deeply, we touch the sun, the clouds, the earth, and everything in the cosmos. We touch life, and we touch the kingdom of God. When I asked Cardinal Jean Donnelou if the Eucharist can be described in this way, he said yes. The body of reality it is ironic that when Mass is said today, many congregants are not called to mindfulness at all. They have heard the word so many times that they just feel a little distracted. This is exactly what Jesus was trying to overcome when he said, This is my body. This is my blood. When we are truly there, dwelling deeply in the present moment, we can see that the bread and the wine are really the body and blood of Christ, and the priest's words are truly the words of the Lord. The body of Christ is the body of God, the body of ultimate reality, the ground of all existence. We do not have to look anywhere else for it. It resides deep in our own being. The Eucharistic rite encourages us to be fully aware so that we can touch the body of reality in us. Bread and wine are not symbols. They contain the reality, just as we do. Everything is fresh and new when Buddhists and Christians come together, we should share a meal in mindfulness as a deep practice of communion. When we pick up a piece of bread, we can do it with mindfulness, with spirit. The bread, the host, becomes the object of our deep love and concentration. If our concentration is not strong enough, we can try saying its name silently, bread, in the way we would call the name of our beloved. When we do this, the bread will reveal itself to us in its totality, and we can put it in our mouth and chew with real awareness, not chewing anything else, such as our thoughts, our fears, or even our aspirations. This is Holy Communion to live in faith. When we practice this way, every meal is the Last Supper. In fact, we could call it the First Supper, because everything will be fresh and new. When we eat together in this way, the food and the community of co-practitioners are the objects of our mindfulness. It is through the food and one another that the ultimate becomes present. To eat a piece of bread or a bowl of rice mindfully and see that every morsel is a gift of the whole universe is to live deeply. We do not need to distract ourselves from the food, even by listening to scriptures or the lives of bodhisattvas or saints. When mindfulness is present, the Buddha and the Holy Spirit are already there. For living Buddha, living Christ his life is his teaching there is a science called Buddhology, the study of the life of the Buddha. As an historical person, the Buddha was born in Kapilavastu, 
near the border between India and Nepal, got married, had one child, left home, practiced many kinds of meditation, became enlightened, and shared the teaching until he died at the age of 80. But there is also the Buddha within ourselves who transcends space and time. This is the living Buddha, the Buddha of the ultimate reality, the one who transcends all ideas and notions and is available to us at any time. The living Buddha was not born at Kapilavastu, nor did he pass away at Kashinagar. Christology is the study of the life of Christ. When speaking about Christ, we also have to know whether we mean the historical Jesus or the living Jesus. The historical Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the son of a carpenter, traveled far from his homeland, became a teacher, and was crucified at the age of 33. The living Jesus is the Son of God who is resurrected and who continues to live. In Christianity, you have to believe in the resurrection or you are not considered a Christian. I am afraid this criterion may discourage some people from looking into the life of Jesus. That is a pity, because we can appreciate Jesus Christ as both an historical door and an ultimate door. When we look into and touch deeply the life and teaching of Jesus, we can penetrate the reality of God. Love, understanding, courage, and acceptance are expressions of the life of Jesus. God made himself known to us through Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God within him, Jesus touched the people of his time. He talked with prostitutes and tax collectors, and had the courage to do whatever was needed to heal his society. As the child of Mary and Joseph, Jesus is the son of woman and man. As someone animated by the energy of the Holy Spirit, he is the Son of God. The fact that Jesus is both the Son of Man and the Son of God is not difficult for a Buddhist to accept. We can see the nature of non-duality in God the Son and God the Father, because without God the Father within him, the Son could never be. But in Christianity, Jesus is usually seen as the only Son of God. I think it is important to look deeply into every act and every teaching of Jesus during his lifetime, and to use this as a model for our own practice. Jesus lived exactly as he taught, so studying the life of Jesus is crucial to understanding his teaching. For me, the life of Jesus is his most basic teaching, more important than even faith in the resurrection or faith in eternity. Mindfulness is the Buddha The Buddha was a human being who was awakened and, thereby, no longer bound by the many afflictions of life. But when some Buddhists say that they believe in the Buddha, they are expressing their faith in the wonderful, universal Buddhas, not in the teaching or the life of the historical Buddha. They believe in the Buddha's magnificence and feel that is enough. But the examples of the actual lives of the Buddha and of Jesus are most important, because as human beings, they lived in ways that we can live, too. When we read, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, we can see that Jesus Christ was already enlightened. He was in touch with the reality of life, the source of mindfulness, wisdom, and understanding within him, and this made him different from other human beings. When he was born into a carpenter's family, he was the son of man. When he opened his heart, the door of heaven was opened to him. The Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, and he was manifested as the Son of God, very holy, very deep, and very great. But the Holy Spirit is not just for Jesus alone, it is for all of us. From a Buddhist perspective, who is not the son or daughter of God? Sitting beneath the Bodhi tree, many wonderful, holy seeds within the Buddha blossomed forth. He was human, but, at the same time, he became an expression of the highest spirit of humanity. When we are in touch with the highest spirit in ourselves, we too are a Buddha, filled with the Holy Spirit, and we become very tolerant, very open, very deep, and very understanding. More Doors for Future Generations Matthew described the kingdom of God as being like a tiny mustard seed. It means that the seed of the kingdom of God is within us. If we know how to plant that seed in the moist soil of our daily lives, it will grow and become a large bush on which many birds can take refuge. We do not have to die to arrive at the gates of heaven. In fact, we have to be truly alive. The practice is to touch life deeply so that the kingdom of God becomes a reality. This is not a matter of devotion. It is a matter of practice. 
The kingdom of God is available here and now. Many passages in the Gospels support this view. We read in the Lord's Prayer that we do not go to the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God comes to us, thy kingdom come. Jesus said, I am the door. He describes himself as the door of salvation and everlasting life, the door to the kingdom of God. Because God the Son is made of the energy of the Holy Spirit, He is the door for us to enter the kingdom of God. The Buddha is also described as a door, a teacher who shows us the way in this life. In Buddhism such a special door is deeply appreciated because that door allows us to enter the realm of mindfulness, loving-kindness, peace and joy. But it is said that there are 84,000 Dharma doors, doors of teaching. If you are lucky enough to find a door, it would not be very Buddhist to say that yours is the only door. In fact, we have to open even more doors for future generations. We should not be afraid of more Dharma doors, if anything, we should be afraid that no more will be opened. It would be a pity for our children and their children if we were satisfied with only the 84,000 doors already available. Each of us, by our practice and our loving-kindness, is capable of opening new Dharma doors. Society is changing, people are changing, economic and political conditions are not the same as they were in the time of the Buddha or Jesus. The Buddha relies on us for the Dharma to continue to develop as a living organism, not a stale Dharma, but a real Dharmakaya, a real body of teaching. The mother of all Buddhas the Buddha said that his Dharma body is more important than his physical body. He meant that we have to practice the Dharma in order to make Nirvana available here and now. The living Dharma is not a library of scriptures or tapes of inspiring lectures. The living Dharma is mindfulness, manifested in the Buddha's daily life and in your daily life, also. When I see you walking mindfully, I touch the peace, joy, and deep presence of your being. When you take good care of your brothers and sisters, I recognize the living Dharma in you. If you are mindful, the Dharmakaya is easy to touch. The Buddha described the seed of mindfulness that is in each of us as the womb of the Buddha, Tathagatagarbha. We are all mothers of the Buddha because we are all pregnant with the potential for awakening. If we know how to take care of our baby Buddha by practicing mindfulness in our daily lives, one day the enlightened one will reveal himself or herself to us. Buddhists regard the Buddha as a teacher and a brother, not as a god. We are all Dharma brothers and sisters of the Buddha. We also say that Prajnaparamita, perfection of wisdom, is the mother of all Buddhas. Historically, in Protestantism, the feminine side of God has been minimized and God the Father has been emphasized, but in Catholicism, there is a great deal of devotion to Mary, the mother of God. In fact, father and mother are two aspects of the same reality. Father is more expressive of the side of wisdom or understanding, and mother the side of love or compassion. In Buddhism, understanding, prajna, is essential to love, maitri. Without understanding there cannot be true love, and without love there cannot be true understanding. The daughter of God the Buddha is said to have ten names, each describing an auspicious quality. The first, Tathagata, means he who has come to us through the right path, he who comes from the wonderful reality of life and will go back to that wonderful reality, and he who has arrived from suchness, remains in suchness, and will return to suchness. Suchness is a Buddhist term pointing to the true nature of things, or ultimate reality. It is the substance or ground of being, just as water is the substance of waves. Like the Buddha, we too have come from suchness, remain in suchness, and will return to suchness. We have come from nowhere and have nowhere to go. One Buddha Sutra tells us that when conditions are sufficient, we see forms, and when conditions are not sufficient, we don't. When all conditions are present, phenomena can be perceived by us, and so they are revealed to us as existing. But when one of these conditions is lacking, we cannot perceive the same phenomena, so they are not revealed to us, and we say they do not exist. But that is not true. In April, for example, we cannot see sunflowers around Plum Village, our community in southwestern France, so you might say the sunflowers do not exist. But the local farmers have already planted thousands of seeds, and when they look at the bare hills, 
they see sunflowers already. The sunflowers are there. They lack only the conditions of sun, heat, rain, and July. Just because you cannot see them does not mean that they do not exist. In the same way we say that the Tap Agatha does not come from anywhere and will not go anywhere. He comes from ultimate reality and will go back to ultimate reality, unbound by space and time. If you walk past the fields near Plum Village in April and ask them to reveal to you the ultimate dimension of reality, the kingdom of God, the fields will suddenly be covered with beautiful, golden sunflowers. When Street Francis looked deeply at an almond tree in winter and asked it to speak to him about God, the tree was instantly covered with blossoms. The second name of the Buddha is Arhat, one who is worthy of our respect and support. The third is Samayaksambuddha, one who is perfectly enlightened. The fourth is Vijakarana Sampana, one who is endowed with insight and conduct. The fifth is Sagata, one who has gone happily along the path. The sixth is Lokavidju, one who knows the world well. The seventh is Anuttarapuru Zedamyasarati, the unsurpassed leader of those to be trained and taught. The eighth is Sastadevamanyasayanam, teacher of gods and humans. The ninth is Buddha, enlightened one. The tenth is Bhagavat, blessed one. Every time we take refuge in the Buddha, we take refuge in the one who has these ten attributes, which are at the core of human nature. Siddhartha is not the only Buddha. All beings in the animal, plant, and mineral worlds are potential Buddhas. We all contain these ten qualities of a Buddha in the core of our being. If we can realize these qualities in ourselves, we will be respected and honored by all people. I see the rite of baptism as a way of recognizing that every human being, when open to the Holy Spirit, is capable of manifesting these qualities, which are also the qualities of being a son or daughter of God. We do not speak about original sin in Buddhism, but we do talk about negative seeds that exist in every person, seeds of hatred, anger, ignorance, intolerance, and so on, and we say that these seeds can be transformed when we touch the qualities of a Buddha, which are also seeds within us. Original sin can be transformed when one is in touch with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Man. We are all, at the same time, the sons and daughters of God and the children of our parents. This means we are of the same reality as Jesus. This may sound heretical to many Christians, but I believe that theologians who say we are not have to reconsider this. Jesus is not only our Lord, but He is also our Father, our Teacher, our Brother, and ourself the only place we can touch Jesus and the Kingdom of God is within us. We continue to be born when we celebrate Christmas or the birth of the Buddha, we celebrate the coming into the world of a very special child. The births of Jesus and the Buddha were pivotal events in human history. A few days after the Buddha was born, many people in his country of Kapilavastu came to pay their respects, including an old sage named Asita. After contemplating the baby Buddha, Asita began to cry. The king, the Buddha's father, was alarmed. Holy man, why are you crying? Will some misfortune overtake my child? The holy man replied, No, your majesty. The birth of Prince Siddhartha is a wondrous event. Your child will become an important world teacher. But I am too old and I will not be there. That is the only reason I am crying? A similar story appears in the Bible. Eight days after his birth, the baby Jesus was brought to the temple for circumcision. When a man named Simeon looked at him, he was able to see that Jesus would bring about a profound change in the life of humankind. When the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, 
For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Whenever I read the stories of Asita and Simeon, I have the wish that every one of us could have been visited by a sage when we were born. The birth of every child is important, not less than the birth of a Buddha. We, too, are a Buddha, a Buddha to be, and we continue to be born every minute. We, too, are sons and daughters of God and the children of our parents. We have to take special care of each birth. Touching our ancestors I am not sure if I am myself or if I am my brother. Before I came into the world, another boy tried to come before me, but my mother miscarried him. If he had continued to live, I would have another brother. Or perhaps I would have been my brother. Many times as a child, I pondered this. Expecting parents have to be very careful because they carry within them a baby, one who might become a Buddha or Lord Jesus. They have to be mindful of what they eat, what they drink, what they think, and how they act. The way they take care of their bodies and their feelings affects the well-being of the child within. Our mothers and fathers helped us come to be and, even now, they continue to give us life. Whenever I have difficulties, I ask for their support, and they always respond. Our spiritual ancestors have also given birth to us, and they, too, continue to give birth to us. In my country, we say that an authentic teacher has the power to give birth to a disciple. If you have enough spiritual strength, you will give birth to a spiritual child, and through your life and practice, you continue giving birth, even after you die. We say that sons and daughters of the Buddha came forth from the mouth of the Buddha, because the Buddha offered them the Dharma, his teachings. There are many ways to offer the Dharma for a child to be born in his or her spiritual life, but the most usual is to share the Dharma through words. I try to practice in a way that allows me to touch my blood ancestors and my spiritual ancestors every day. Whenever I feel sad or a little fragile, I invoke their presence for support, and they never fail to be there. Suffering in the way out as children, Siddhartha and Jesus both realized that life is filled with suffering. The Buddha became aware at an early age that suffering is pervasive. Jesus must have had the same kind of insight, because they both made every effort to offer a way out. We, too, must learn to live in ways that reduce the world's suffering. Suffering is always there, around us and inside us, and we have to find ways that alleviate the suffering and transform it into well-being and peace. Monks and nuns in both their traditions practice prayer, meditation, mindful walking, silent meals, and many other ways to try to overcome suffering. It is a kind of luxury to be a monk or a nun to be able to sit quietly and look deeply into the nature of suffering and the way out. Sitting and looking deeply into your body, your consciousness, and your mental states is like being a mother hen covering her eggs. One day insight will be born like a baby chick. If monks and nuns do not cherish their time of practice, they will have nothing to offer to the world. The Buddha was 29, quite young, when he became a monk, and at the age of 35, he was enlightened. Jesus also spent time alone on the mountain and in the desert. We all need time to reflect and to refresh ourselves. For those who are not monks or nuns, it may be difficult to find the time to meditate or pray, but it is important to do so. During a retreat, we learn how to maintain awareness of each thing we do, and then we can continue the practice in our daily lives. If we do this, we will see deeply into the nature of our suffering, and we will find a way out. That is what the Buddha said in his first Dharma talk at the Deer Park in Sarnath, Look deeply into the nature of suffering to see the causes of suffering and the way out. Monks and non-monks can all practice this. I am the way the Theravada school of Buddhism emphasizes the actual teaching of the historical Buddha, the Buddha who lived and died. Later, the idea of the living Buddha was developed in the Buddhism of the northern schools, the Mahayana. When the Buddha was about to pass away, Many of his disciples were upset that he would no longer be with them. So he reassured them by saying, My physical body will no longer be here, but my teaching body, Dharmakaya, will always be with you. Take refuge in the Dharma, the teaching, 
to make an island for yourselves. The Buddha's instructions are clear. The Dharma is our island of refuge, the torch lighting our path. If we have the teaching, we needn't worry. One monk who was very ill expressed regret at not being able to see the Buddha in person, but the Buddha sent word to him, My physical body is not what is most important. If you have the Dharma body with you, if you have confidence in the Dharma, if you practice the Dharma, I am always with you. Jesus also said, Whenever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. I am always there for you after the Buddha passed away. The love and devotion to him became so great that the idea of Dharmakaya changed from the body of teaching to the glorious, eternal Buddha, who is always expounding the Dharma. According to Mahayana Buddhism, the Buddha is still alive, continuing to give Dharma talks. If you are attentive enough, you will be able to hear his teachings from the voice of a pebble, a leaf, or a cloud in the sky. The enduring Buddha has become the living Buddha, the Buddha of faith. This is very much like the Christ of faith, the living Christ. Protestant theologian Paul Tillich describes God as the ground of being. The Buddha is also sometimes described as the ground of being. Seeing the way is seeing me to encounter a true master is said to be worth a century of studying his or her teaching, because in such a person we witness a living example of enlightenment. How can we encounter Jesus or the Buddha? It depends on us. Many who looked directly into the eyes of the Buddha or Jesus were not capable of seeing them. One man who wanted to see the Buddha was in such a hurry that he neglected a woman in dire need whom he met along the way. When he arrived at the Buddha's monastery, he was incapable of seeing him. Whether you can see the Buddha or not depends on you, on the state of your being. I am understanding, I am love like many great humans, the Buddha had a hallowed presence. When we see such persons, we feel peace, love, and strength in them, and also in ourselves. The Chinese say, when a sage is born, the river water becomes clearer and the mountain plants and trees become more verdant. They are describing the ambience surrounding a holy man or woman. When a sage is present and you sit near him or her, you feel peace and light. If you were to sit close to Jesus and look into his eyes, even if you didn't see him, you would have a much greater chance to be saved than by reading his words. But when he is not there, his teachings are second best, especially the teachings of his life. Freedom from notions when I read any scripture, Christian or Buddhist, I always keep in mind that whatever Jesus or the Buddha said was to a particular person or group on a particular occasion. I try to understand deeply the context in which they spoke in order to really understand their meaning. What they said may be less important than how they said it. When we understand this, we are close to Jesus or the Buddha. But if we analyze their words to find the deepest meaning without understanding the relationships between the speaker and his listeners, we may miss the point. Theologians sometimes forget this. When we read the Bible, we see Jesus' tremendous courage in trying to transform the life of his society. When we read the sutras, we see that the Buddha was also a very strong person. The society of India at the time of the Buddha was less violent than the society into which Jesus was born, so you may think the Buddha was less extreme in his reactions, but that is only because another way was possible in his milieu. His reaction to the corruption among Vedic priests, for example, was thoroughgoing. The notion of Atman, self, which was at the center of Vedic beliefs, was the cause of much of the social injustice of the day, the caste system, the terrible treatment of the untouchables, and the monopolization of spiritual teachings by those who enjoyed the best material conditions and yet were hardly spiritual at all. In reaction, the Buddha emphasized the teachings of non-Atman, non-self. He said, things are empty of a separate, independent self. If you look for the self of a flower, you will see that it is empty. But when Buddhists began worshipping the idea of emptiness, he said, it is worse if you get caught in the non-self of a flower than if you believe in the self of a flower. The Buddha did not present an absolute doctrine. His teaching of non-self was offered in the context of his time. It was an instrument for meditation. But many Buddhists since then have gotten caught by the idea of non-self. They confuse the means and the end, the raft and the shore, 
the finger pointing to the moon and the moon. There is something more important than non-self. It is the freedom from the notions of both self and non-self. For a Buddhist to be attached to any doctrine, even a Buddhist one, is to betray the Buddha. It is not words or concepts that are important. What is important is our insight into the nature of reality and our way of responding to reality. If the Buddha had been born into the society in which Jesus was born, I think he, too, would have been crucified. Seeing the way, taking the path when Jesus said, I am the way, he meant that to have a true relationship with God, you must practice his way. In the Acts of the Apostles, the early Christians always spoke of their faith as the way. To me, I am the way is a better statement than I know the way. The way is not an asphalt road. But we must distinguish between the I spoken by Jesus and the I that people usually think of. The I in his statement is life itself, his life, which is the way. If you do not really look at his life you cannot see the way. If you only satisfy yourself with praising a name, even the name of Jesus, it is not practicing the life of Jesus. We must practice living deeply, loving, and acting with charity if we wish to truly honor Jesus. The way is Jesus himself and not just some idea of him. A true teaching is not static. It is not mere words but the reality of life. Many who have neither the way nor the life try to impose on others what they believe to be the way. But these are only words that have no connection with real life or a real way. When we understand and practice deeply the life and teachings of Buddha or the life and teachings of Jesus, we penetrate the door and enter the abode of the living Buddha and the living Christ, and life eternal presents itself to us. Your body is the body of Christ when the Protestant minister described me as someone who was not grateful, he was speaking a language different from Buddhism. To him, love could only be symbolized by a person. That is why belief in the resurrection is so important to Christians. If Jesus died and was not resurrected, who would carry his eternal love for us? But does God have to be personified? In Judaism and Christianity, the image of a person is always used. Thanks to the practice of many generations of Buddhists and Christians, the energy of the Buddha and the energy of Jesus Christ have come to us. We can touch the living Buddha and we can touch the living Christ. We know that our body is the continuation of the Buddha's body and is a member of the mystical body of Christ. We have a wonderful opportunity to help the Buddha and Jesus Christ continue. Thanks to our bodies and our lives, the practice is possible. If you hate your body and think that it is only a source of affliction, that it contains only the roots of anger, hatred, and craving, you do not understand that your body is the body of the Buddha, your body is a member of the body of Christ. Enjoy being alive to breathe and know you are alive is wonderful. Because you are alive, everything is possible. The Sangha, the community of practice, can continue. The church can continue. Please don't waste a single moment. Every moment is an opportunity to breathe life into the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Every moment is an opportunity to manifest the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is a person whose appearance on earth is for the well-being and happiness of all. Who is that person? This is a question from the Angadara Nikaya. For Buddhists, that person is the Buddha. For Christians, that person is Jesus Christ. Through your daily life, you can help that person continue. You only need to walk in mindfulness, making peaceful, happy steps on our planet. Breathe deeply, and enjoy your breathing. Be aware that the sky is blue and the bird songs are beautiful. Enjoy being alive and you will help the living Christ and the living Buddha continue for a long, long time. 5 Communities of Practice Mindfulness of Working Street Gregory of Nyssa taught that the contemplative life is heavenly and cannot be lived in the world, that whenever a monk has to leave the monastery to do some apostolic work, he must lament. Many monks do in fact cry when they have to leave their monasteries for an apostolic ministry. Other teachers, like Street Basil, said that it is possible to pray as you work. But he did not mean that we can pray with our actions. He meant pray with our mouths and our hearts. In Vietnam, 
We invented engaged Buddhism so we could continue our contemplative life while in the midst of helping the victims of war. There must be ways for monks to continue their contemplative lives while engaging in society. In Vietnam, we did not try to avoid the suffering. We worked to relieve the suffering while, at the same time, trying to maintain our mindfulness. Even in monasteries, we have to cook, clean, sweep, and wash. How can we avoid these? Is there a way to work in a meditative mood? The answer is clearly yes. We practice mindfulness of cooking, cleaning, sweeping, and washing. When we work this way, we touch the ultimate dimension of reality. But we need training to do this, and it helps very much to have a community in which all the members are sharing the same practice. In fact, it is crucial to be with a Sangha or a church where everyone practices together or dwells mindfully in the spirit. We need to create such communities for our own benefit. Monastic culture Thomas Merton wrote about monastic culture. A monastery or practice center is a place where insight is transformed into action. The monastery should be an expression of our insight, our peace and our joy, a place where peace and beauty are possible. The way the monks and nuns their walk, eat and work expresses their insight and their joy. When someone from the city arrives in a monastery compound, just seeing the trees and gardens and hearing the sounds of the bell can calm him down. When he meets a monk walking peacefully, his tension may wash away. The environment, the sights, and the sounds of the monastery begin to work in him for healing and transformation, even before he listens to any liturgy or teaching. Through their true practice and genuine insight, those who live in monasteries, temples and practice centers offer us a way to obtain peace, joy and freedom. When monks offer retreats, they initiate people into the practice of mindfulness, of touching the best things within themselves and touching the ultimate dimension. They know the time is limited, so they offer only practices that retreatants can bring home and continue in their daily lives. If someone is too busy for a week-long retreat, it is still helpful to come for a weekend or a day of mindfulness, or even half a day. The monks and nuns can offer the peace, joy, and stability they have obtained through the practice. This kind of life can be described as monastic culture. When you practice with others, it is much easier to obtain stability, joy, and freedom. If you have a chance to visit a retreat center, I hope you enjoy your time there sitting, walking, breathing, praying, and doing everything in mindfulness. Community is a refuge in Christianity, the church is the crown of the path of practice, the true teaching authority. It is often said that there is no salvation outside the church. In Buddhism, a Sangha is a group of monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen who practice together to encourage the best qualities in each other. Some Buddhists respect only the holy Sangha, the actual disciples of the Buddha during his lifetime. But they are already gone. To me, to practice with the Sangha means to practice with those who are with you now and with those you love. It may not be a holy Sangha, but if it moves in the direction of transformation, it is a real Sangha. We do not need a perfect or a holy Sangha to practice. An imperfect Sangha is good enough. We can help build and improve the Sangha by practicing mindfully, step by step, encouraging each other. There is a saying, if a tiger comes down off his mountain and goes to the lowlands, he will be caught by humans and killed. It means if a practitioner leaves his or her Sangha, it becomes difficult to continue the practice. Taking refuge in the Sangha is not a matter of devotion. It is a matter of practice. The Buddhist Sangha includes arhats, those who have overcome all afflictions, and stream enterers, those who have entered the stream that will surely lead them to enlightenment. Stream enterers have no doubt that the practice will transform their suffering. In Christianity, some people have been declared saints or holy persons. Perhaps they are similar to our heads and stream enterers, but I must confess I don't understand how it is decided who is a saint. Community is a body in John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. This is close to Buddhism. Without mindfulness, we cannot bear the fruit of love, understanding, and liberation. 
We must bring forth the Buddha in ourselves. We have to evoke the living Buddha in ourselves in order to become more understanding and more loving. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. In Buddhism, it takes at least four persons practicing together to be called a Sangha. That allows the Sangha Karma, the legal procedure for making decisions in community life, to be possible. When we live as a Sangha, we regard each other as brothers and sisters, and we practice the six concords, sharing space, sharing the essentials of daily life, observing the same precepts, using only words that contribute to harmony, sharing our insights and understanding, and respecting each other's viewpoints. A community that follows these principles always lives happily and at peace. When we gather together to form a Sangha, we practice opening up the confines of our separate self and become a large body of love and understanding. We and our brothers and sisters are one. This idea of salvation is echoed in the Eastern Orthodox Church, which has even more of a sense of togetherness, you can only be saved as a community. The Holy Spirit is the soul of the church when you hammer a nail into a board and accidentally strike your finger, you take care of the injury immediately. The right hand never says to the left hand, I am doing charitable work for you. It just does whatever it can to help, giving first aid, compassion, and concern. In the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, the practice of dana, generosity, is like this. We do whatever we can to benefit others without seeing ourselves as helpers and the others as the helped. This is the spirit of non-self. In Christianity, every member of the church is said to be a part of the body of Christ. In Buddhism, we say that each Sangha member is like a hand or a leg of the Buddha. When we live in accord with the teachings of the Buddha, we are members of one body. If we practice the precepts well and realize deep concentration and understanding, our Sangha can arrive at liberation from afflictions. Even when liberation is not yet total, people can look at our community and appreciate the loving and harmonious atmosphere. When we practice understanding and love, we are a real Sangha, a fertile field in which good seeds will surely flower. If there are too many misunderstandings, disputes, and rivalries among members, a Sangha cannot be called a real Sangha, even if it is in a beautiful temple or famous practice center. A church or community that is not filled with the Holy Spirit is not alive. A Sangha that is not pervaded by the energy of mindfulness is not authentic. For a community to be a real place of practice or worship, its members have to cultivate mindfulness, understanding, and love. A church where people are unkind to each other or suppress each other is not a true church. The Holy Spirit is not there. If you want to renew your church, bring the energy of the Holy Spirit into it. When people appreciate each other as brothers and sisters and smile, the Holy Spirit is there. When mindfulness is present, understanding, prajna, and love, Maitri and Karuna are there, also. The Holy Spirit is the energy of love and understanding to have a good Sangha, the members must live in a way that helps them generate more understanding and more love. If a Sangha is having difficulties, the way to transform it is to begin by transforming yourself, to go back to your island of self and become more refreshed and more understanding. You will be like the first candle that lights the second that lights the third, fourth, and fifth. But if you try your best to practice in this way and the people in the community still have no light, it may be necessary to find another Sangha or even start a new one. But don't give up too easily. Perhaps you have not practiced deeply enough to transform yourself into a living candle capable of lighting all the other candles. Only when you are convinced that creating a new Sangha is the only alternative to giving up is it time to go ahead and create a new Sangha. Any Sangha is better than a non-Sangha. Without a Sangha, you will be lost. The same is true within a church. If you see that the Holy Spirit is not present in your church, first make the effort to bring the Holy Spirit in by living deeply the teachings of Jesus. But if you have no impact, if the practice in the church is not in accord with the life and teachings of Jesus, you may wish to gather those who share your conviction and set up another church where you can invite the Holy Spirit to enter. To be a real help to your church or sangha, you must first light your own fire of understanding, 
love, solidity, and stillness. Then you will be able to inspire others, whether in an existing group or one you are helping establish. Please don't practice religious imperialism. Even if you have a beautiful temple or church with fine decorations and artwork, if inside there is no tolerance, happiness, understanding, or love, it is a false sangha, a false church. Please continue to make an effort to do better. To be real salt the living teaching expressed by the lives of the Buddha and Jesus should always be the models for our practice. The sutras are not the living teachings of the Buddha. To receive the true teaching, we must emulate the life and work of the Buddha himself. The same is true of Christianity. The Gospels in their written or even oral form are not the living teaching of Jesus. The teachings must be practiced as they were lived by Jesus. The Church is the vehicle that allows us to realize those teachings. The Church is the hope of Jesus, just as the Sangha is the hope of the Buddha. It is through the practice of the Church and the Sangha that the teachings come alive. Communities of practice, with all their shortcomings, are the best way to make the teachings available to people. The Father, Son and the Holy Spirit need the Church in order to be manifested. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, people can touch the Father and the Son through the Church. That is why we say that the Church is the mystical body of Christ. Jesus was very clear about the need to practice the teaching and to do so in community. He told his disciples to be the light of the world. For a Buddhist, that means mindfulness. The Buddha said that we must each be our own torch. Jesus also told his disciples to be the salt of the world, to be real salt. His teaching was clear and strong. If the church practices well the teachings of Jesus, the Trinity will always be present and the church will have a healing power to transform all that it touches. Are we practicing the true teaching? Are we making Jesus' presence real in our churches today? Are we making the Buddha's presence real in our sanghas? The Buddha and the monks and nuns of his time were in continuous dialogue with those of other religious faiths, especially the Brahmins. Are we in dialogue with other religions? The Buddha made every effort to remove the barriers between classes. He accepted untouchables and other outcasts into his holy community. Are we doing the same with the poor and oppressed of our day? Are we bringing the service of the Sangha and the Church to those who suffer, to those who are discriminated against politically, racially, and economically? The Buddha accepted women into his Sangha and they became teachers, transmitters of precepts, playing the same roles as the monks. Jesus also taught women freely. The first person Jesus revealed himself to after his resurrection was a woman. Are we allowing women to be ordained priests and teachers? The Buddha and his monks and nuns practiced voluntary poverty. They owned only three robes, one bowl, and one water filter. Are we able to live simply, content with just what we need? Or are our religious institutions simply building and acquiring more and more? The Buddha and his monks and nuns went begging every day to practice humility and to remain in contact with people in their society. Jesus in his time did very much the same. He did not own anything. He always made himself available to people. He reached out and touched others in order to understand, to help, and to heal. The people he touched were mostly those who were suffering. Are the Sangha and the Church of today in real touch with people? Are the churches today touching the poor and oppressed, or do they prefer to touch only the wealthy and powerful? The Buddha always resisted violence and immorality. He withdrew his support from King Ajatasatru when the latter assassinated his father in order to ascend the throne. He tried to stop King Ajatasatru's efforts to start a war with the neighboring country of Vichy. Are our Sanghas doing the same, opposing social injustice and violence, or are we blessing wars and sending priests along with our armies to support the efforts of war? With utmost courage, Jesus taught a gospel of nonviolence. Is the church today practicing the same by its presence and behavior? Do the churches practice nonviolence and social justice, or do they align themselves with governments that practice violence and hatred? During the Vietnam War, the city of Ben Tre was destroyed in the name of salvation. The commander of the operation said, we had to destroy Ben Tre in order to save it. Is it possible that a servant of the church blessed the troops being sent to such a war? 
Jesus needs Christians for the Buddha to be present in the Sangha, we must practice in a way that keeps his teachings alive, and not confined to sermons and scriptures. The best way a Buddhist can keep the teachings of the Buddha alive is to live mindfully in the way the Buddha and his community lived. For Christians, the way to make the Holy Spirit truly present in the church is to practice thoroughly what Jesus lived and taught. It is not only true that Christians need Jesus, but Jesus needs Christians also for his energy to continue in this world.